Welcome to the Big Bets on Campus podcast presented by BetMGM. I am your host in this midweek episode, Jim Root, joined by the rest of the three-man weave crew, Kai McEwen and Matt Cox. It is March Madness, folks. We have a delightfully chalky Sweet 16 to dig in on and analyze. We like when our Cinderella's are gone by this round. It gives us better matchups. That's just a, a biased weave take, but we're excited about what we ended up with here. You'll get plenty of coverage from the action crew this week, but we're giving you our perspective on all eight games this weekend, thoughts on sides, totals, any other derivatives, player props, et cetera, that we see value on. We will start with Thursday's quartet of games, going by region, then we'll hit Friday. Fellas, let's get into it. The West region, the first tip on Thursday, out in L.A., early tip local time, 4.09 p.m., Arizona and Clemson. Oh boy, Matty Cox, let's talk about it. Arizona did a nice job speeding up both their games in the early rounds. We know the Nets kind of held things up, made it a little harder to get over. Uh, that was actually a big talking point. Tommy Lloyd even brought it up in his post-game presser uh, in their games in Salt Lake City. It was hard to get uh, made shots out of the basket and get going. Should not be a problem here in LA. Clemson's already handled two elite backcourts in Baylor and New Mexico. Might try to keep the pace down in this one. What are you looking at as an angle on this game? Arizona right now laying seven and a half per bet MGM, total of 151 and a half. Well, my first angle is uh, the net manufacturers. Are they going to be back in the uh, back in charge here of this region? Because if so, I'm going to be looking to bet unders pretty hard. I have no idea how we can have such an issue uh, at this point in the year, but the NCAA never ceases to amaze us, Kai. The, I guess the conflicting angles on this game are can Arizona win in a half court game? Did they prove they could against Dayton? Is that, does that convince you enough that they can carry that forth and will most likely be a half court game against Clemson versus is this Clemson run for real sustainable, which I think we'll probably get into similar parallels with NC state, another ACC darling, the other side of the bracket. Um, I've kind of come all the way in on Clemson Kai. Like I, I know we talked about how good PJ Hall has been, Chase Hunter's been really that guard revelation for them. Um, Making shots, adding a dose of dynamism to a backcourt that we basically made fun of for not having any um, all year. And and Arizona's perimeter defense has been very impressive despite some cracks that emerged during the regular season, but it's not bulletproof, right? I don't think it's like a hounding Houston level or UConn level defense. I kind of like Clemson with the points just as I looked at the seven and a half opener, but I hate that I'm saying that God. No, I agree, and I, I do believe in Clemson to your, to one of your points. In the preseason, we all liked Clemson, I, I believe. Um, I thought they were a top 25 team for sure. Definitely could have competed for the ACC title. Obviously, it didn't work out that way in the conference standings, but they were 10-1 in non-con, and it, they looked legit, and they're kind of coming full circle. Uh, it is a bit of a clash of styles. Yeah, Arizona wants to go out and transition, of course, every single possession. Clemson, more half-court, but not immune to, to transition offense. Uh, Clemson's transition D, it's okay. It's not great. Uh, it, will, it will be interesting to see who wins the quote-unquote pace ba- uh, matchup. The the angle or the matchup I'm looking for, though, the most is the front court. P.J. Hall, Ian Shefflin, I, uh, it would seem they have an advantage against Umar Balo. They can both step out and shoot. Uh, they've been really good defending the post this season. And Arizona's had a little bit of issues defending on the block, and that's kind of surprising to me just given that they have Balo. Paul and Shefflin are, are very scrappy front court players, versatile. I, I, I kind of like them in this matchup. However, Arizona does have, I think, the dynamic guard edge, Jim. And my one worry, though, is Caleb Love, of course. Is he going to get, are we going to get the bad version or the good version of Caleb Love? Is he going to tighten up towards the end of the game if Clemson's close or winning? That's always the question. I agree with Matt. I, I like Clemson here at, at plus seven, plus seven and a half. It's generally been good, Caleb Love, so far, or at so least far. <laughs> median. You know, we haven't gotten the disaster game. You know, first round, he didn't shoot that well, but he had five assists, no turnovers. Second round against Dayton, not as great of a ball handling game. Five assists, four turnovers, but six of 15 from the field. I think Arizona can live with that. It's not a five for 22 type of disaster. Impressively for Clemson, They've only gotten 39 total minutes out of P.J. Hall so far this tournament. He's got nine fouls and six rebounds. He has been saddled to the bench in both games. And I think that's the fear here, too, with Ballo ranking top 100 in the country and fouls drawn per 40. Could potentially put Hall on the bench again. 
And that's just one more game where they're testing how much can Chase Hunter keep delivering, uh, how much can that backcourt and really decent frontcourt depth hold up against Arizona's brutish front line with, with Ballo and Keisha Johnson giving a little more versatility. I have a hard time reading this game on the side, guys. I have a real hard issue with it. I do lean to the under. I think Clemson can slow it down a little bit in Arizona. Uh, I know they only played – uh, 146 points against Dayton, but 72 possessions. They did speed up a very half court team there, uh, but I trust Clemson's very, very experienced roster to, to keep this in the half court. They know they can't run with Arizona and survive. So uh, not much of a lean on the side, but I do like the under and I kind of like some of the PJ hall under stuff because I think foul trouble could once again, come back to bite him the way that it did in the first three round or first hey. two rounds. To put a bow on that, I, I think the guy that no one talks about who's been quietly mega important for Clemson is Jack Clark, um, super yep. important defender, uh, NC State castaway. Uh, I kind of zoomed out, looked at his, like the ebbs and flows of Clemson's season. Like when he's been in there and been healthy, uh, when he got put into the starting lineup, they've been awesome. He's been playing 30 plus minutes. To your point, Jim, if Hall's in foul trouble, um, I don't think there's any hesitation for Brownell to play him um, to play him in Shefflin. Like, obviously, you miss everything that Hall gives you on offense, but I think defensively, you still feel like you can compete and you hope your guards stay hot, hope you can kind of slow it down and execute during those lulls or stretches. So, yeah, I guess to your point, I like under and I like the Hall under uh, by association, I guess, if you're looking to bet props. Yeah, God- Godfrey's been good for them too. I mean, that is a, like, big, deep front line. It is not just two guys. Like, they can go three, four deep there. Uh, even Chauncey Wiggins, 6'10 guy that can slide inside, more of a stretch big, but can help them out there. So, yeah, they're not going to get completely bullied. I uh, just worry about the foul trouble of these starters. That's that's the mon- thing to monitor. All right, the nightcap in L.A., UNC getting the one seed out west. Obviously, maybe not the ideal draw for them if they were to see Arizona in the final. would be an extremely pro Wildcat crowd. But here we've got Alabama, the number four offense in the country per Ken Palm. Kai, they've actually slid. Out of the, they were number one basically all year, uh, now down to number four. Going up against UNC's number six defense that we have had some skepticism about in ACC play when teams weren't making threes. But even as that's kind of evened out a little bit, the defense has stayed fantastic. Baycott's been a very good drop defender. And this is a big step up in competition for Alabama. They've gone through two double-digit seeds here. I I fear their interior defense, something that Florida took advantage of a lot, a very offensive rebounding centric team giving it away here. But I think Baycott has a monster game against this front line. That That's pretty much my biggest angle here. I do think maybe at four and a half, it's a little too low. I like the heels, but mostly give me a Baycott feast in the paint. Yeah, I think I'm going to agree with you. Uh, really fun game, high octane up and down 170s is, is where the point total is probably going to land here. Tons of possessions two explosive offenses. The difference is the UNC defense. It's way better than Alabama's. UNC is going to be able to exploit them on the offensive glass. Baycott, they're going to earn trips to the foul line. UNC's also guarded the three ball pretty well this year, and and obviously the three-point percentage is clearly a little bit of luck, but they've also taken it away uh, to a, a decent extent, and that's obviously going to be a huge focus against Alabama. Offensively, Alabama, transition, right? Handoff, pick and roll, that sort of action. UNC's transition defense this year, excellent. They don't allow much. Also rank the 99th percentile in points per possession allowed. Uh, obviously a huge factor against Alabama. And then, yeah, Matt, on the other end, I don't see Alabama stopping UNC in transition. They haven't stopped anybody off the bounce all year. A little bit of a matador defense sort of thing going on. I have a really hard time trusting Alabama's defense in general. Um, so I'm going to agree with Jim's lean on, on UNC on the side. I kind of like Alabama. I, I've i been stubbornly convinced the defense is not as bad as the numbers indicate. I'll, I'll give you two feeble reasons as to why. Um, well, one, just look at last two games. Uh, Mo Diabate, Diabate, I can't say anyone's name, um, was was an absolute monster. Changed the game against Grand Canyon, was great against Charleston. Um, I think he had another versatile defensive piece to that lineup that I think kind of shifts that team to more of a balanced attack as opposed to like offense, offense, offense. Matter our defense, matter defense, matter our defense. Uh, also, just look at their their defensive like profile. The, Oates, Oates has been pretty gung ho on limiting three pointers for their opponents his whole career. This year, they've been much more, uh, much more shell like. I, I want to say, um, and so it, they they've allowed a lot more threes. I think it's actually helped them contain drill penetration a little bit better at times. 
Now, it looked good against Grand Canyon. Obviously, Grand Canyon's disastrous offensive shot selection made their defense look better than it was. I still believe Alabama and Illinois, to some extent, they score so easily that I think they let off the gas defensively. Like when they really need to get stops, I think they'll get more stops than they have on a purpose judgment. Very stretch of a an angle there, but I, I'm kind of stubbornly convinced Alabama is going to guard better than I think people think here. I think that's – I'm going to go the other way and say that's very friendly, uh, Matt, as a perspective. They gave up 1.16 points per possession to Charleston in the first round. Charleston only shot 30% from three on 33 attempts from deep. I think there's still a lot of uh, shaky defenders, shaky scheme, and they get pounded on the glass. They gave up 15 offensive boards in both games to mid-major opponents. Now you're facing Alabama or uh, UNC, who has Baycott, has a little deeper front line, a little more size up front. Uh, I think that could actually be a, a major issue for them. Uh, and Alabama's actually been okay in the offensive glass in this tournament against mid-major front lines. UNC, a top 10 in the entire country in defensive rebounding rate. They do not let you have second chances. Alabama's not going to get those kick-out threes, which are sometimes some of their best looks. I know they love transition, but also uh, top 30 offensive rebounding rate. That leads to kick-out trays. Shouldn't really be there against UNC's defense. Uh, I, I like UNC a lot, actually. The more I think about it, the more I get into it. Four and a half, I, I think they kind of run away. Maybe not quite as much as they did against Michigan State in the second round, but I just think they can kind of score at will against this defense. So I like uh, Baycott props and UNC minus four and a half. No real take in the total. 173 and a half is, is awfully high. Um, I'll stay away from that one. To the East region where UConn continues to reign supreme, complete domination. The Northwestern game in the second round was nowhere near as close as the final score made it look. It was a complete smashing right out of the gates. Now, Matthew, a rematch of the 2023 title game for the Huskies. San Diego State, this is when taking place in Boston. A reminder on the travel here for San Diego State ended really late uh, against um, and their their previous round game in Spokane, Spokane yeah. back to San Diego, now across the country for a Thursday game, not a Friday game. Uh, the early tip, kind of a tough turnaround for them. Is that something we care about here, or is this March Madness? These are 21-year-olds who gives a crap, just bet the actual game. What do you think? Uh, no, for, for the record, spread is UConn minus 10.5, total 135.5 as we record this at BetMGM. Yeah, well, actually, Jim, I'd argue UConn has the. I mean, have you heard Dan Hurley's comments? But, but just the outrageous hand that they were dealt, uh, having to go oh, a whole bus ride oh, from uh, New York to Boston. Um, spare so, yeah, me. <laughs> just a tough, tough draw for old Dan. I love Hurley just continuing to warp his team's mind to the disrespect because you have yeah, an awesome, to. talented, yeah. well coached team, <laughs> and this mindset of like legitimately we're the underdog. It's just a, it's an unbeatable comment. It is exactly why they were dominant last year. It's exactly why they've been dominant this season. Just a couple of factoids for you, very basic, and there's some overlap between these, so I apologize. But 11 and three against the spread non conference last two years, UConn, 11 and two against the spread on neutral sites. You get them out of like the home road, especially on the road in the Big East against coaches that know their stuff a little better. They're, they're mortal ish in that playground, but like outside of that, they're just a dominant force. And I'm, I'm going to continue to hold on to this belief that last year, will be a precursor to what we see again this season. I officially took the 10 and a half 11, Jim. I think they lay the absolute wood to um, to the Aztecs, as big as that number looks. Ty, you could argue it's a major tax, given Kempom has it eight, and the Aztecs have looked pretty good so far. Um, I mean, Jalen is an absolute force up front, but I mean, you know, he hasn't seen anything like Donovan Klingon or Samson Johnson in those dogs. So I, I think UConn hands it to him. I, yeah, I really do, plain and simple. Another team like Bama that's played two double-digit seeds, and now it's like, hey, here's the best team in the tournament. Here's a real team. Welcome to your first test. Yeah, yeah that's what I'm worried about. Now, last year, San Diego State did the same thing. They beat two double-digit seeds, and they beat Alabama, the one seed. UConn's better than Alabama was last season. This team doesn't have a weakness. Uh, they they really almost look bored playing offense. They're so fantastic. It's just every single way you want to put it, they, they can score. Uh, San Diego State's defense, obviously elite, but they struggle to score at times. They're, if they're not getting stuff from Ladie consistently, which they usually have this season, they can stagnate on the offensive end. Both teams are pretty balanced in terms of style. Uh, UConn, one of the best cutting teams in the country. It, just the play designs, they've been all over the internet, obviously. Fantastic coaching staff, ball screens, transition. They excel in everything. San Diego State, weirdly, weak 
against cuts this season from a synergy perspective. If you just zero in on their cutting defense, a little bit surprising there. However, clearly a good defensive team in transition with ball screens. San Diego State has to play through Ladie in the post. That just is really tough to do against Klingon and Johnson that Matt mentioned. I think that's the matchup advantage right there for UConn. And frankly, Jim, I don't want to bet against UConn. So I agree it seems a little bit high, but I would lean towards UConn or just stay away. Yeah, this is probably lame to hear from like, a, you know, you're looking for nuanced betting angles. But to me, it's like UConn just isn't measured properly. I mean, they had stints with Castle out, stints with Klingon out. It, it, I don't think they're really, even where they at number one in Ken Palm, they, they might not even be measured properly there. Uh, they went on a 16 to two run against San Diego state in the title game last year in the first like 10 minutes pulled away. We're up double digits the entire way. You know, I guess San Diego state cut it to eight with five minutes left, but it, it never really felt super in doubt there. And I kind of think we get something similar here. UConn top five on both ends of the floor in two point percentage. It's just like a completely indomitable style of play. The sh- the quality of the shots they get, the unselfish ball movement, like the fact that Spencer can put up 10 assists when he's supposed to be like an off screen shooting guy is absurd. They, they have an, a total wealth of options, wealth of talent. And I just don't think this San Diego state team is the one that's going to stop that run. So uh, I'm riding with these boys, UConn. I think they continue to lay the wood all the way through this tournament. No real take on total or props here for me. It's just like a simple UConn smash, however they want to do it. I, I did kind of break up my bet into first half full game. So I took some full, some first half and some full game. Um, a little bit of foot off gas late against Northwestern. I just don't think you see that here in the bigger stage, far than the tournament, the first game after the prior weekend. Like I think they got full juice going all the way through where you could argue maybe in the second half against Northwestern, they had a little bit of fatigue on the sh- whatever, I don't know. I, I It's a smash all the way through. I just think first half probably has uh, a, a smidge more of value than full game, given how big it is of a number 11. Yeah, and 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 if you care about that travel angle, it's probably going to show up in the first half, as Matt's Yeah, it's a good point. Like, more sluggish, really. State. Yep. Um, all right, the nightcap there in the East region, Illinois and Iowa State, three seed to two seed. Here's your chalky matchup in the Sweet 16. If you like the Alabama UNC offense defense matchup, this is the one for you. Illinois, the number one offense in the country per Ken Palm. Iowa State, the number one defense in the country. Both these teams are 2-0 against the spread so far, have have really looked awesome uh, and not really threatened so far in their runs. Kai, what are you looking at with this game? It is the closest spread we've had so far in our in our little breakdown. Iowa State laying one and a half per bet MGM, a total of 145 and a half. Yeah, clearly the the battle of rock and hard place, whatever you want to call it, unstoppable force, immovable object, uh, number one offense versus number one defense. Illinois, number one offense, really snuck up on me, actually. Uh, recently overtook, uh, I believe it was um, UConn for the number one spot in, in Kempom. Uh, yeah, Terrence Shannon, man, I don't know how you stop him. Just going downhill in transition, he's an impossible to stop. Even Iowa State, I think, might have trouble with him. However, the lack of a true point guard for Illinois – I think is what kind of bites them in, in this matchup. Iowa State, <clears throat> they force a lot of turnovers. They really hound the ball handler. And while Domask and Shannon have done a nice job kind of taking on the de facto point guard roles, I think not having a true point out there is going to be a problem. Um, I, I do think Illinois' defense isn't quite as harmed in this matchup, just given Iowa State's offensive uh, issues at times. Illinois hopefully can lock down just a little bit defensively. They've been really bad down the stretch here. But I, I, I do lean towards Illinois, Matt. I, I'm going with a more dynamic offense here. Uh, Iowa State, I just don't fully trust their scoring ability. Despite the great defense, I think Shannon's the difference, and, and, and Illinois moves on. I am too. I did bet Illinois small. I'm with you. I'm it, As I've been saying, it's more of a Jimmy's and Joe's bet and a bet on the just relentless momentum we've seen from this Illinois version, especially the last couple of weeks with Shannon back in the fold. All the offense is going Dane Danger and reemerging as an awesome uh, thunder to the lightning of Coleman Hawkins, I guess, if you want to call it that. And, and Iowa State, like, Jim, I feel like this take is stale. And, and factually, is a stale take. Like, the offensive distrust, at some point, we probably have to move on from that. Um, you know, it's been a better offense all year. We said before the season, hey, this this Altelberg roster looks a little more balanced this year. Like, they got some offensive skill. And we thought that would be a sacrifice to the defense. But lo and behold, they're better defensively as well. So, 
at some point we need to buy into the Illinois, the, the Iowa state thing, those of us who haven't. Um, but I, I just, I go back to 2022, their exit game first round against, uh, or sorry, in the speed 16, 0.79 points per possession last year when Iowa state got bounced 0.66 points per possession. So I, I feel like there's a stink bomb lurking in the, uh, in, in the, in the future for Iowa state's offense, but maybe I'm just jaded by last season in the year before, which have no bearing on this team, which is a different roster and has more skill and more shot make. Um, so yeah, I've talked myself in circles around this gym. I still believe my gut tells me Illinois is the better team. Yeah. Is the stink bomb coming against Illinois defense? That, that's the question. Like, is that the one that can actually pull that poor performance out of the Iowa state offense? I'm not sure that's the case. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned the Illinois momentum. If they hadn't blown that game to Penn state, we'd be talking about like this 11 of 12 complete turbo fire that they've been on. Uh, playing through Marcus Damask in the paint has been like golden for them. I think they kind of do that again here, that mid post and, and Iowa state loves to double that, which uh, leads me to a Marcus Damask assist bet. And, and I don't know if we've been fully on this because his last four games, seven assists, 10 assists, eight assists, eight assists. Like he is racking them up like a Tyler Kolick type numbers as teams try to converge on him, stop him in those one V one matchups. He is finding shooters and Illinois guys are knocking them down. I mean, you fan it over to Terrence Shannon and he's at the rim and, and one dribble like lightning. So I do like his over assists. I kind of lean Iowa State here, though. I think, like Kai said, they can muck up the the ball handling as Illinois just tries to get it over half court. The, the transition defense is terrific for Iowa State. So getting into their stuff is going to be what's more difficult for Illinois. Uh, and then manufacturing points in the half court for Iowa State, that's something they've got to figure out. But Illinois' defense, like you know exactly what you're getting against it. It's drop coverage, not forced turnovers. They rank second in the country behind Creighton and most mid-rangers surrendered. So you have to think Iowa State's prepared and working on what they know they're going to see here. Uh, and I think that's kind of advantage Otzelberger on the prep. Um, so I, I'm going to go Iowa State there, but player prop wise, the Damask over an assist. Quick question for you both. Which one gives UConn or, or would it be capable of giving UConn a better game? Kai, I'll go to you first there. Just a, a best version of the team. Illinois. Illinois. I'm far more talented. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's, I think it's correct. We saw Iowa State play UConn last year in, uh, okay, you saw it in person out in Portland and yeah. UConn handled one by 18. Again, better version of Iowa State, definitely no question about it, but uh, I still think it's a, a big gap for them to, to climb there. All right. To Friday we go, starting in the South region, the only double digit seed surviving and playing this weekend. It is no Cinderella. It is NC State, just an ACC squad, a lowly ACC squad. They are taking on Marquette in the opener down in Dallas. Matthias, I'll go to you first here. Marquette laying six and a half. Uh, can they guard DJ Burns in the post? Can NC State handle Marquette's devastating ball screen and off the dribble attack? It, me thinks there are points here. I just don't know if the pace is going to yeah. get there. I feel like efficiency is going to be high. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I don't worry as much about the Marquette guarding Burns. I worry about them getting, just curling the glass. Burns is a part of the offensive rebounding attack for NC State. But as a team, like the Wolfpack aren't some crazy glass crashing team. So like that, that's my biggest concern with Marquette defensively. Like I know they're smaller, but they got Chase Ross back, Kolick's back, and the pressure on the perimeter is still really good. And they're still sound defensively. The question with them is, can they corral misses and get out in transition and get the offense going? Like that, that's where I think Marquette, like their defense, does really fuel their offense. Shaka always says that cliche, but from them, like the way they play, it really applies. Um, it, it, the other concern here is, like, I'm just looking at NC State. Like, I don't want to over-examine the path to get here in terms of assessing is this new version of them a real version? But they did beat a pretty brittle Texas Tech team that was kind of been running on fumes the last few weeks. And they beat Oakland. They needed overtime to do it. And Oakland didn't exactly shoot the lights out themselves either. So, uh, you know, NC State, the Burns thing is awesome. Part of me is like, okay, I look at that path and I'm not super convinced. But then I also look at this team, Kai, and I see like a team that has a really high ceiling just because of the Burns factor and how dynamic he is. But also their guards can take and make tough shots. It's mm -hmm. why they've, you know, it's burned them plenty of times in ACC play. But they can play to a, you know, a pretty high level. They can rise their game. And just to put a bow on that, uh, I know you'll see about a million goalpost moved, sliced and diced ATS trends on Twitter all week, folks. But uh, underdogs of five points or more are 36 and 26 
with a cover margin of 2.2 points in the Sweet 16 since, 20, since 2005. So point me, I, I do think there's some real thing to dogs having momentum at this point. I just don't know if NC State's as real because of who they played in the context. Matt, you didn't bring that up when you wanted to bet UConn. You know, right, exactly. <laughs> so the key is Jim handicapping and doing content shows is mentioning points that support your point and then conveniently just ignoring the other ones. That's just that's brilliant that's right. work by me. Brilliant yeah. work by me. Yeah, uh, I'm not convinced by NC State's start, Matt, with the Oakland game. Yeah, they uh, could have lost regulation. I'm not convinced by Marquette's start either, though. It's a dicey start to Western Kentucky game. They're down seven and a half. Colorado kept pace the entire way. It was impressive short shot making with both teams. That, that game was awesome. Uh, the question, actually, excuse me, I'm going to start with this. NC State, those guards you mentioned, yeah, they don't make mistakes, man. They, they're top 15 in turnover rate. Horn, Taylor, Morsell, they've been awesome uh, the, This uh, during this stretch here in the tournament, AC tournament. And then, yeah, DJ Burns. Iguodaro is a good defender. He's giving up a lot of weight. He's giving up six, 60 pounds-ish uh, to, to Burns. I, not many guys can stop him. NC State plays through Burns. He's a great passer. Heavy ball screens, heavy post for, for Burns. I would expect Marquette to extend zone looks, extend their three-quarter pressure into a half-court setting, but not not sure about that, obviously. Uh, NC State has been bad at guarding ball screens. That's kind of Marquette's bread and butter. Tyler Kolick, obviously the best, well, maybe not obviously, but I'll say one of the best point guards in the country right now. I, Jim, of the total aspect, I do kind of agree with your uh, over edge. It seems like efficiency will be high for both teams here. Um, I think NC State, at the end of the day, is a little bit easier team to game plan for. So I lean towards Marquette. Yeah, I like Marquette, too. I, I, I know Colorado kept that game close and ended up landing at four. But that felt like a little bit outlier shot making from Colorado in the stretch uh, down the second half. Marquette, uh, Kolick was really controlling the game. I don't think he made a jumper the entire game, but he had like 20 points just completely controlling pace, getting downhill to his left hand when he needed to, getting uh, getting it off the glass and finding open shooters or open drivers. As we mentioned, the the efficiency stuff, Marquette's 47th percentile nationally defending post-ups. I think Burns could give them serious issues there, and if Iguodaro gets in foul trouble, that's a problem. I think Marquette will double just to avoid the potential for foul trouble. And then the other end, uh, NC State, 28th percentile defending pick-and-roll ball handlers. Like a lot of that has to do with Burns moving in space and, and not really being able to handle that. We know Marquette is one of the most lethal ball screen offenses in the country. They can invert that with Iguodaro as the ball handler and Kolek screening for him. Poor Kolek trying to, to screen DJ Burns. Good luck, bud. Don't get run over. Uh, but yeah, I, I see plenty of rods to efficiency on both sides, but especially Marquette. Uh, I think they're going to score. I, I lean that minus six and a half in the early tip in Dallas. The night oh, wait, about, real quick, sorry, oh, I just hit me, just kind of like aha epiphany. Michael O'Connell, I know he's played well lately, but look who he's played well against. Like Michael O'Connell against pressure, like real pressure. Yeah, he had a nice game against Oakland's, you know, whatever zone. Like I'm looking at his worst games of the year. Texas Tech, goose egg. He played actually really well. They actually gave it six assists. But like his worst games have clearly come against bad teams. I mean, good teams. Uh, I think he is just in for a real awakening, and they, they're going to need to try and move him off the ball and let Horn and... Taylor and Marcel do more of the work. Um, uh, th that's a very obvious adjustment that Keats needs to make in this game early. Just a just a thought. I bet. Do you do you think less minutes? Are we are we betting Michael O'Connell unders? I think less. Yes, yes. Thank you. It's there a prop betting show, Jim. Very good. Um, except if you're Jonte Porter, don't close your ears. But yes, I agree with you, Michael O'Connell. Um, I think he will be reluctant or um, relegated to a lesser role in this game. Valid, valid point. Uh, Duke versus Houston, probably the brand name headliner of this round, uh, especially just given the uh, the the Duke resurgence that they showed against James Madison. But Kai, I want to just quick pause on that. Everyone's going nuts about the Duke backcourt, how hot they were in that game. In the loss against NC State in the ACC quarterfinals, Roach, McCain, Proctor, a combined five of 27 <laughs> from the field. And now you're facing this crazy athletic perimeter that just survived by the hair of their chinny chin chin against Texas A&M. I, I think you're getting a massively engaged defensive effort from the Cougars. Uh, I, I worry that the Duke love of the backcourt is going to maybe be overdone this week and come down to earth against Houston. Um, what are your thoughts here? Houston laying three and a half total, a low total here in this round, 134 and a half. 
Yeah, the Houston defense is insane. They're good at everything. And I think they can kind of shock opposing teams that aren't used to it. Like if Duke doesn't come to play, they will get hit in the mouth. And it might be just a total, it sends them, sends them reeling a bit uh, when you first see that Houston defense. Now, if they hit shots, they can definitely win this game. Houston, if they are susceptible to anything, it's the perimeter hitting shots. And Duke has shown that they can do that. McCain looked like a true NBA talent against James Madison. We know Flip is Proctor's hitting. It's going to be pretty tough to to beat Duke. The offensive glass, the foul line are also paths that Duke can exploit to score points offensively. On the other end, Houston could just bully him, man. Offensively on the, on the glass, they are bullies. Shed is a terrific creator, especially off ball screens. Duke does defend that action pretty well. Um, but again, Matt, it comes down to, will Duke be ready for the intensity at which Houston plays? If they can handle it, kind of bounce back to the initial shock of it, I, I think Duke can hang around. So I lean Duke on the spread. My heart's with Houston. I'm rooting for Kelvin Sampson and the Cougars to get it done, but lean towards Duke on the spread. The gut tells me the physicality of Duke, I'm sorry, of Houston shocks Duke, as I've seen a couple of times before this season. Um, however, I like the over. Uh, Houston feels like an, like, uh, I mean, I know their defense has gotten all the ink, but like, man, they're shooting the crap out of the ball. Like, you got Shed there, Dyson through defenses. He gets the lane whenever he wants to. Cryer can shoot it from anywhere, mid-range and behind the arc. Sharp hasn't missed a shot since Dom, it feels like. And, <laughs> and, and with the front line, especially Roberts, I know that Shin, they say, is fine. He almost, like, didn't play in this tournament because it was so bad. It kind of came back to uh, it flare up again last game. And that front line all of a sudden felt a little bit brittle and I know a is like one of the best offensive rebounding teams in the country, but you saw a get to the glass, get to the rim a little more easier than I think you people would have anticipated. Now, Duke does not, they're not that physical. They're not that athletic, but they're more skilled. And I do think they can get in the, in the teeth of the defense, loosen Houston up a little bit. I like the over 134, the way both teams are shooting it, scoring it. And with some of the concerns I have with both teams, front lines defensively, Sean Stewart, a big X factor here. But if John Steyer plays Ryan Young for more than 10 minutes, I will be calling his phone directly um, the day after. Final point here, Jim, the whistle will be a frustratingly important part of this. Um, the two, Whoever gets two fouls first, Filipowski, you know, could flip, um, or you know Roberts or, or Francis, I, I think that's going to be a pretty big key because Houston's so aggressive, and the whistle is such a key determinant in how their games are played and how they uh, ebb and flow throughout. Yeah, so is Coach K doing some back channel stuff? Because we know Shire doesn't lay into the, yeah, the refs the same way that Coach K did, and um, he doesn't. Does he command the same fear as Coach K did either? Right. So yeah, probably whistle yeah. price cues toward Houston and Samson. Was yeah, good Paul. Yeah, potentially. I mean, the the whistle I I thought in the Houston Texas A and M game was heavy for Texas A and M. I mean, four starters fouled out for Houston. Granted, they commit a lot of fouls, but uh, it, there were a couple late calls specifically. LJ there's some bad ones. Foul. I agree that gave way Taylor three, three shots and sent a good shooter out of the game was uh, bad, bad, but can Duke take advantage of that? A, a team that does foul fairly frequently Duke's only 136 nationally in free throw rate. It's not something that they do all the time, especially their guards are not guys that put rim pressure on you. They are shooters. They are skilled guards. Only Mitchell and Filipowski really put pressure on you to get to the stripe. So I think that actually does favor Houston a little bit. Uh, and I, I totally agree with like, the, I, I thought James Madison's toughness would, would give Duke a little test, but it turned out Duke was so hot from the opening tip that it didn't end up fully mattering. Uh, and Houston is just a different beast. Uh, I'm going with the Cougars there, despite uh, laying a short price. I think it's a little too short. Duke's great performances and Houston allowing Texas A&M back in the game. I think we'd have seen like four and a half, five, if it wasn't for that Duke shooting explosion. So I'm going to take the Cougs. I'm seeing Jim real quick. Jamal Shed nine to one to win tournament most outstanding player. Not to get way too ahead of ourselves here. Um, that sort of is like okay, like he is so he's been so good, yeah. and like the the narrative has been like clearly he has captivated. At, like he, but he the question the is, does Houston win? Right, doesn't leave the floor. If they win, he's winning it. The question is, do they win? And at least they're on the opposite side of the bracket as. Uh, as UConn, so I think that gives him like a better chance to go all the way. Now I just looked at this last player to win most outstanding player on a losing team was uh, Akeem Olajuwon <laughs> in 19, 1983. So not going to happen. So you need Houston. Again. You need Houston to win the tournament for him to win. Yeah, but, but it's a better price bet. than betting Houston. Yeah, yeah. Bet, yeah, betting just Houston as a team. And I know Sharp has been obnoxiously scorching, uh, but he only had thirteen in the first round game. 
And there is an element of just like people know how good of a defender Shed is. It gives him the reputational bump. He controls every aspect of the game. He has the ball in his hands like constantly. I, I think he, it would be really stunning if Houston won the title and he did not win most outstanding player. So to your point, perhaps that's where the value is instead of betting Houston. All right, finally, fellas, to the Midwest region, Gonzaga laid the smackdown on Kansas in the second round, giving us this rematch from Maui. Kai, Purdue laying five and a half in the rematch from the first game, just to remind some people. Uh, rather low-scoring game. Neither team really shot it well. It, the, the start of the game was odd. Grant, Graham E.K. hit two threes, and it seemed like, oh, he's going to unlock the, the defense. Purdue's going to have to play him on the perimeter. Then he got in a little bit of foul trouble. And, and just historically, he went two for six from three in that game. In the 30-game sense, he's one for six. It is a complete <laughs> outlier. He does not shoot threes. I don't think that's going to be something that happens. And again, it's so hard for a front line to avoid foul trouble against ED. Utah State got into it immediately. What are you looking at with this one, Kai, as well as the Zags are playing? Can they keep up with the Boilers? Yeah, this is EK versus ED. That, that is the matchup. Both teams play through the post among the heaviest uh, percentages of any team in the country. Uh, defending the post. Both teams really good at it. So, so it's literally strength versus strength here. Now, I would say whoever gets in foul trouble loses, ED or EK. If ED's off the floor for Purdue, they'll obviously struggle. If EK is off the floor for Gonzaga, they'll struggle. Game one, you mentioned EK, four fouls, ED, zero. ED had 25 and 14 and zero fouls against Gonzaga in the first matchup. I trust ED a lot more to play without fouling. I worry heavily for Gonzaga if... EK is off the floor. Now, can they go with a more a more mobile five that can shoot the three if, if, EK, if EK is out? Yes, they could. However, I do like Purdue's supporting cast also better than Gonzaga's. So I'm going with the Boilermakers here. Uh, against my better judgment on Matt Painter, Matt, in the last couple of years in the tournament. Yeah, I'm very torn on this one. I, just a good way to look at this. Uh, it's funny that Purdue could potentially face all three Maui teams that they beat in their path. If it shakes out that way, um, the spread in that November 20th matchup against Gonzaga closed five and a half. So basically <laughs> if you accept the fact that nothing has changed from then to now, you could, you could attack that from both teams. Shim, I, that from that lens, as like, I kind of like Gonzaga with the way they've, you know, it feels like they've improved, got a lot better. Um, and, and, I, and I know Purdue was awesome and like all the way awesome against Utah State, but I look at that game again using my context of path to get here is like that was a Utah State white flag to me. Like Danny Sprinkle was inked to Washington. I think that was just a we're done and and they there was no fight along with that being a bad matchup. I don't think we've actually seen Purdue be tested this this turn. So I think this game is closer. Uh, I just you know I'm with Kai. I don't know if I want to actually take. I feel like I should be getting six or seven just the gut of how dominant Dee Dee is. Um, but I think there's value on Gonzaga a little bit smidge. Man, I'm not. I'm not touching this one. I I think I bet Gonzaga. Or, uh, I bet Purdue back in that opener, uh, all the way back in Maui. I just had them rated higher, and I I think they've improved since then. But I think Gonzaga's improved more to where now I think the line is somewhat correct. Um, Purdue's guards have really not been tested. That's the the thing everyone's been kind of holding over their heads all season. Is are they going to be able to handle some pressure when it comes? Uh, are they going to be able to get the ball to ED against teams that can take that away? Well, I think Mark Few is going to have a nice game plan trying to scheme the ball out of ED's hands. Purdue just has such a deep array of sets. Uh, again, Kai, you mentioned some of the UConn ones that have been all over Twitter. Purdue has had a, a few mm -hmm. plays go really viral this week too. And Gonzaga's like bottom 120 in the country, 246th in defensive turnover rate. Like the, They're not going to be throwing stuff at Braden Smith and Fletcher Lawyer that are going to, stress them out. I think Purdue is going to be able to get into their stuff. And once they do, it is so good. And it is so hard to stop ED within that, um, that as long as it's not ice cold shooting from Purdue, they move on. Uh, perhaps there's a little shooting regression coming from Purdue. Cause yeah, they shot the lights out against Utah state, but man, everything was open. Like Matt said, maybe a little white flag from Utah state in the second half there. Um, so staying away from this game, this one's fully a, a sit out for me. Now we get the nightcap. Not a Maui rematch because Creighton was the big or uh, Marquette was the big East team that was on the island. Now we've got Creighton tagging in for them to take on Tennessee. 
the Vols actually, Matt, survived a terrible shooting performance in the second round. That that's something that's always been the uh, the bugaboo with the Rick Barnes team. Can they actually survive bad shooting when teams junk it up against them? We know they can play defense, but can they produce enough points? They did just barely against Texas, and now they face this uh, this drop defense in Creighton that is super similar to Purdue, super similar to to Illinois. Uh, can the Vols hit enough mid-rangers and, and can they limit the jump shooters of the Jays enough to cover here? Minus two and a half for bet MGM, 143 and a half total in the nightcap. Now you hit all the matchup points. I, this is a simple handicap for me. I just got tells me I like betting Greg McDermott against Rick Barnes. Like um, it's a simple narrative. And it's going to be cited all over Twitter. Kai, I just feel like I'm getting bonus points with the better coach with the team who I liked better in the preseason. Now, again, I know a lot's changed since then, but you know, we've seen some of the data come out about how there's never been a team, I believe, in the top, uh, not in the AP poll to make a Final Four run. Like, I think there is some evidence that preseason expectations is there's some predictive power and how high your ceiling is, how far in this tournament you can go. We've seen Ken Palm, I think, talk about that on Twitter. So I, I kind of like trusting my initial priors with Creighton here, Kai. Um, but yeah, tough. It, this one, high variance game, right? A lot of threes. If you can predict he's going to make shots, as is the case with any bet in this stupid sport, then uh, you'll probably be okay. But this one, I think, especially has a high variance outcome. What was the preseason AP, AP poll thing? Uh, I don't have the exact, but Ken Palm talked about how uh, it, the I think if you're not out in the top 25 of the preseason uh, poll or top 30 receiving votes, you've never made it past the Elite Eight. Let me find the exact tweet. I think but, I'm but pretty Tennessee sure was, Tennessee was number six. Tennessee definitely was. Poll. Yeah. Tennessee was ranked highly in the, in the preseason. I think Matt's just kind of using it to say oh, no, that. Right. Oh, yeah, sorry. Right. So point value. being, yes, very good point. I'm using my own preseason. Like, basically, I thought Creighton was better in the preseason. I think preseason stuff matters. Nine, yeah. And I'm anchoring to that more. Okay. Yeah, they're 8-9. Your your they're 8-9 preseason poll. Creighton is slightly above. I mean, I I think Tennessee's been top 10 all season, they, even preseason stuff. So I, I, I guess I disagree with you not thinking they're top 25 or whatever it was. But I, I think it's hard to bully Creighton. Uh, and that's what Tennessee's been doing to teams. Cockburn are a stout defender. I just really hate the Jays can't force turnovers. Uh, that gives them a thin margin for error. And maybe you say the same thing about Illinois, but the Jays are just like so extreme. It's like they're not creating advantages with their defense and and or at least causing turnovers. And that's, I think, a, pr- a problem. Shooting's going to be huge for them. Three-point shooting. They can't get inside looks. They're a great two-point percentage team. Creighton finishing inside mid-range. Tennessee just doesn't allow that. Top 10 in the country in two-point percentage defense. The Vols also defend screens well, creating a lot of off-ball screening motion, right, to get shooters open. I think Tennessee defends that action pretty well. I think Dalton connects a matchup issue for really anybody, and I think he's a matchup issue for Creighton as well. I lean towards Tennessee here. Um, not strong, short spread, obviously, but I, 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 like, I like the Vols. Yeah, I like the Vols too. It doesn't feel awesome to say that about Rick Barnes and the tourney, but – I don't think we get two terrible Dalton connect shooting games in a row. And he was five for 18 from the field against Texas. Now he's going to get like open mid range jumpers all the time against this defense. I think he can knock those down. That's super high release. Even if you've got somebody chasing him, uh, I'm not too worried about that. Tennessee is 65th nationally in mid range shooting percentage. Like they can handle that. And Creighton gives up the highest percentage of those shots in the entire country. So you'll see Tennessee firing away from there. I also, you know, Matt, you, the Will Warren's newsletter and some of the Jordan Majeski site write-ups that talk so much about shot volume. Like, I, I feel pretty confident Tennessee's going to take more shots in this game because Creighton doesn't force any turnovers. They do not go after the offensive glass. Every game for them is so reliant on making a, a higher rate of shots than their opponent. And Tennessee can actually shoot it this year. I, I know they're not quite at the level of Creighton in terms of knocking down jumpers, but they have shown much improvement. And again, uh, coming off a nightmare performance, I, I think you see a little bit of uptrend in their uh, ability to hit shots. So I, I think connect might be a decent overbet in terms of yeah, player props. I agree. Tony of opportunities uh, to to gun. Yep, and, and then I, I do lean Tennessee there, just from a matchup perspective. Worried about the coaching thing, but uh, has I don't believe McDermott's ever been to the. Uh, I guess he made the Elite Eight last year, lost right at the, the cusp of the Final Four. That was his yep. first time there. Barnes uh, has been to the Final Four. Yes, that he has many moons that ago. All the real way back quick, in the, uh, ever in Knoxville. the the Ken Palm thing. I should be. This was a much more relevant stat in Iowa State's discussion because it's literally related to Iowa State. But there has never been 
a top two seed in the tournament that was unranked in the preseason to make the final four, 0 and 38. So my point is basically directly relevant to Iowa State. It's not really relevant to Creighton. My general point is I do think preseason priors have some predictive power. And so I am anointing my preseason ratings as gospel. So F the AP pool is my point, basically. But your your points were better, and I, I agree with you guys. Um, I'm looking to bet props in this game. And definitely live. This is a good live betting game, I think. I think we have some swings. Yeah, if the there's game. a big sh- shot-making flurry from one team early, perhaps yeah. there, there's a reply uh, where one team makes more jumpers the other way. So keep an eye on that. Keep an eye on live betting possibilities. All right, fellas, that's it. It's just a Sweet 16 preview. We're not giving you revised Final Four. Uh, we're not talking futures here, unfortunately. Just breaking down the games. That is it. We've hit all eight from this weekend. We are very, very excited to watch them. Uh, So tune in. You should watch them too. They're going to be great. We've got chalky matchups. That means high uh, talent individual games should be some slugfest. We're excited. Uh, Thank you for tuning in. Thank you to our loyal sponsor at BetMGM. We'll be back again next week with a Weave BBOC preview of the final four. We'll see you then. Cheers. 